Welcome to the P1 Ventures podcast. My name is David DeSalt. I'm the founder and CEO of P1 Ventures. If you use Excel spreadsheets and email to manage your supply chain, you want to listen to this podcast. This podcast is going to talk about how we are solving that problem using software, and PJ is pioneering the space of really improving supplier management in a time of chaos on a global scale. Today's episode, I have Michael Visk with me, the VP of Sales at P1 Ventures. Hello, hello. And to my left, I have PJ Belomo, the CEO of Piston, which is a great, brand new, forthcoming, increasing, improving, amazing SaaS startup in the supply chain space. PJ, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Hey, guys. I just had to set the expectations really high for yeah. you because Michael and I are so used to setting it so low for ourselves. So we just want to lift you up, PJ. Today's a special episode. I love having PJ here. Uh, because we're going to talk about software and how that integrates well with the manufacturing industry. Dating back to 2017, I uh, read a great book called Upstarts, which talks about the founding of Airbnb and Uber, related really to two-sided marketplaces, shared economy, you know, how they really pulled off those business models uh, over the last 15 years or so. And what it sparked or inspired in me was the idea of, can we create a two-sided marketplace in the manufacturing industry? And the reason why it made sense relative to Uber and Airbnb, if you look at the case of Uber, for example, they have very expensive assets like cars that have a ton of latent capacity in them. And they have fundamentally put those assets and the people that own them to work to turn idle assets into currency or revenue. Airbnb is the same thing. You own a house, it's a very expensive asset. It has latent capacity, meaning open rooms, stuff that's not being used all the time. So Airbnb created a marketplace to turn those assets into revenue or cash flow. So we had the same idea, but dating back to 2017, about turning the latent capacity and manufacturing companies into revenue for those companies that own them. And some rough numbers. Again, this is a little bit dated, but there's something like 35% available capacity on manufacturing assets globally. And if you think about that, that's trillions yeah. of dollars mm -hmm. of unused manufacturing capacity around the world. Did you know about that data? Yeah, because I read the book that gave you the epiphany. Did you really read that Not book? Not oh, okay. <laughs> PJ, what about you? I mean, we've talked a lot about this, but the, the idea of putting assets to work in manufacturing, that's kind of the conversation you and I started having in 2019 when we yeah, first started. Right, sure. And, you know, since, you know, we talked about that, have you validated that data? What do you think about that concept in general? Yeah, so I guess this is anecdotally, but it's not anecdotally with, you know, two customers. It's anecdotally with, say, 50 if you just look at how many people are not running three shifts a day, seven days a week, I mean, just that simple fact. Yeah. There's, there's manufacturing assets that are idle more than 50% of the time is what I would guess. So even that 30%, I think to myself, well, that's probably driven by the fact that, you know, somebody like uh, Foxtron is, uh, they're probably idle 1% of the time. Yeah, right. But if you looked at, manufacturers that are say under 500 million dollars or even uh, manufacturers under 100 million dollars in revenue geez how what percent of the time are their machines running mm. yeah exactly you know and if you look 60 percent of the time you look at our own business 50 what would what would you say uh, well i'd say you know so, on a seven day so week, I, I would say 24 7 i would segment it mm -hmm. i'd say small businesses and those that have less than 20 employees and we have some of this data, right? So if you look just at machining companies in the United States alone, 16,000 plus machining companies with less than 20 employees, their capacity utilization is probably sub 50%. Right. Strictly because it's typically a 10, 12 person mm. shop. They're running one shift, um, you know, working intermittently based on having contracts and so forth. And we see a lot of that with our supply chain. Oh, it's very difficult to optimize capacity in a high mix, low volume environment. It's it's you know you don't know when orders are coming in everything's you know spot bought on the um, you know with very short lead time so it makes it very difficult to plan in that in that yeah. environment. They call that the uh, contract manufacturing conundrum. Yes, mm. trying to utilize your assets more efficiently when you're typically making a lot of cats and dogs, right? You're not making yeah. a standardized product line, so on and so forth. So you know we started looking at that problem. So I segmented further. So you look at small business. I think if you go over to the very very large end, like automobile manufacturers, yep. airplane manufacturers, obviously standard product lines. Capacity utilization is going to be much higher, yeah. probably in the 75% range mm -hmm, of that. Yes. You know, there's obviously downtime for breaks and, 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 you know, Saturday, Sunday, that kind of stuff. But generally, that middle grouping, companies like where we sit, you know, I mean, look at our data. We, we run a full for first hour or first shift with about 10 hours a day. 
We run that five days a week. We run what I would call a skeleton second shift. And the reason we do that intentionally is because the conveyance of the knowledge and expertise to set up and manufacture the complexity stuff that we're doing is very hard to bring to second and third shift. However, um, we're running probably 60 to 65% utilization, but our capacity in terms of available capacity is typically always full, mm. right? Because yeah. I think we do a pretty good job of turning stuff around. But that was the impetus of really looking at software. And let me, let me tell the, the listeners for a second, the light bulb that went off for us was, okay, if we have all this latent capacity in the manufacturing industry and the manufacturers are uh, distributed, right? They're, they're, they're not in you know simple blocks. They're not one company. There are 16,000 machine shops spread across the entire United States. So you have geographic disparities. You have um, you know, you know, all kinds of different things that make it very yeah. distributed. The only thing that can solve distributed assets is software, mm -hmm. right? The, and back in the old day, it was, it was uh, conglomerates, right? Using yeah. management and stuff like that. But in today's day and age, it was software. And I remember when I first met you, PJ, that's kind of the first concept I pitch you around building a software division of our company was to use it to subcontract at scale that's right. and really leverage the capacity of those, uh, those smaller shops that have open capacity. Right, yeah, that was 2019. Funny thing was I was finished, finished up a gig in DC, coming back to upstate New York, just doing networking and um, someone connected me with you and that was our first conversation, kind of taking a look and you talked about, hey, you know, we'd like to do this inside of package one industry. That's right. P1 industry. Yeah, I mean, and, and, and frankly, you and I had the conversation in 2019, and I'll never forget the first thing you said to me. You said, look, Dave, don't ever be afraid to shift gears on me. Right. <laughs> right, because, you know, anytime anyone who's, you know, we, we every business that we own and operate today, we started from the ground up. So we're, we're an entrepreneurial story in the manufacturing industry. We're not a second, third generation company that's been handed down. We didn't buy the company and have to yep. shift the culture and do everything else. Yep. And you joined in like year five of when we started the company. Yeah, been yeah, it was year five, since. yeah, yeah. So we kind of had that mentality, and you and I connected really strongly in that level to say, hey, we're, if, if we do this, it's going to shift and change pretty considerably. And I remember you told me that in 2019, which kind of made you know triggered a pretty good relationship. Yeah, because my experience is you, you create a plan because you think you know what you're doing, and then it makes sense to execute the plan, but whether it's day 60 or day 120, you're going to have learned stuff and say, oh, yeah, that was... <laughs> that was not right. the right plan. Exactly. So then to stick with it makes no sense anymore. Right. So when people get frustrated about entrepreneurs who change their ideas. I mean, let me be clear. I've met some pretty flighty, you know, entrepreneurs and but but people are out there working and executing that usually change because the market is saying, Yeah, don't do it that way. Do it do it differently. Yeah, so that actually brings me to kind of where we are today. You know, back in 2019, we had this vision, read the book. We had this vision of really building this two-sided marketplace with software. And then through our conversations, through a couple of starts and stops and everything else, what we discovered was the software we wanted to build could truly transform P1's business model. And we've had that chat back in 2018, 2019, yeah, 2020. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And we started putting it into, into action. What did we start doing? Yeah, we started subcontracting on a very uh, rapid scale. I mean, there's, you know, in New York State alone, there's, you know, thousands of uh, manufacturing companies and partners with underutilized assets. And we can uh, we can solve problems for our customers by providing them capacity that we can't offer without jeopardizing the workload that we have. Yeah, well, the concept behind that is the whole one-stop shop concept. Right? right, exactly. You know, you only have finite capacity and capabilities in-house. Yeah. But how do you really – and look, the, the idea of supply chain and capabilities is not a new concept. No, no, no. But what we want to discover was what I'll call the diamonds – that are the suppliers that are five to ten people right. located maybe in rural areas, typically a craftsman who yep. put a number of machines in their garage. Big companies are not going to have access to yeah. that capacity, but it's very talented capacity sure. and it's very low cost capacity. Yes, or, yes. you know, relative. It's almost speaking. a conundrum. You know, it's actually you know, it's not something you would expect. You know, where you're getting this high quality at a low cost. It's almost counterintuitive. Right. So we kind of went off on that pathway, but then PJ and I started talking a lot about. Well, this is the software itself could be a very significant and a transformative tool for P1 Industries, right? We, we talked about the concept of launching a new business called Spindle and, and really using the software combined with our physical capabilities and our competencies as a team to really build out the supply chain. And then PJ, you and I started talking a lot. We said, <clears throat> well, geez, you know, I think the software, and this is pre-pandemic, this is in 2019, early mm -hmm. 2020, we, uh, we believe that the software could be very valuable to other companies. 
So in Q1 of 2020, you set out to talk to a number of manufacturing companies about their pain points in their supply chain. Just curious what you discovered and how that process went. Well, the first thing we validated, and in all honesty, we had a good viewpoint from just kind of working with your company first, is that everyone manages their supply chain with Excel spreadsheets, email, and telephone calls. And it's kind of amazing to look at a $25 million company, $100 million company, billion dollar company, and $5 billion company and say, Oh my God, they're, they're all doing it the same way. I mean, they often say, if you take away your cell spreadsheets and emails out of supply chain, supply chain goes away. That's right. <laughs> it's funny because the same, you know, you compare a company uh, who's using QuickBooks to someone who's using SAP, and obviously there's big differences between those two ERP systems. But uh, when it comes to interacting with their supply base, it's not materially different. The big companies have more people, more yeah. emails, yeah. more more spreadsheets going out. But, you know, we've, you know, we've seen numerous Fortune 500 companies. PJ, every single client that we have, some of the largest corporations on the planet manage supply chain with Excel. That's not a dig. That's not no. an issue. No. It's just the way people have been no. doing it for a long time. Right. So what was the major pain point that you took out of those? I mean, I, if I remember correctly, during first quarter of 2020, you went on maybe 15 discovery phone calls mm -hmm. and visits with large-scale manufacturers you know, supply chain people. What was the, the number one pain point that came to the front when, you know, yeah. through those conversations? So I'm going to cheat and tell you three pain points. Um, the first most evident pain point is what everybody sees, but it's the least exciting one. And that is in purchasing, um, everything's just a mess. They're, they, they do it on a spreadsheet. You know, I won't take the audience through the back and forth emails and trying to update a spreadsheet, but but sooner or later, maybe by a Monday afternoon, you have one spreadsheet inside your business that gives you some level of idea of when your orders are coming in, what's running late. Is there and we're talking specifically everything that's outside the manufacturing organization. We're not talking about inside because ERP kind of covers the inside. Yeah, 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 right, right. So outside the walls of your organization. Peels placed on a supplier. Right, You're right. waiting for product to come in at some point in the yeah, future. Yeah, right, right. Incoming, incoming raw materials, incoming parts and assemblies. If you've sent stuff out for um, outside services where you have to have something tested and get back to you, that's all the stuff you're waiting on to be able to make whatever you make for your customers. And, and there's a lot of busy work. And around that and it's not unusual to have multiple people managing it if you're big enough there's clerical staff and it's not in the in the end you're you're doing a job poorly but you're getting it done but you're yeah. just doing it poorly it, it, and on that point you know let, let michael step in for a second you work with a lot of our customers yep. and giving updates on on orders and everything else you know, just hit that point home. What's that process look like from inside P1? We're pretty much exchanging Excel spreadsheets with our clients. Mm -hmm. And you have to uh, work with our purchasing team, work with our engineering team to see where certain jobs are within the process. And there's nothing that really aggregates all the information. You use a bunch of different tools uh, like Monday.com. You, you utilize your ERP system. You have to integrate these all together. Everything is fragmented. And it's, it, it's a, I'm not going to say it's a, you know, uh, difficult uh, process because you know obviously it's our job but you know there's something where it leads some efficiencies to be gained yeah. for sure so so that kind of validates it from our end so that's pain point number one yeah right is is kind of the tracking right of oh, once you place the order on a PR on a, on a supplier is the tracking the mechanisms as you call it the patchwork right of right. Yeah. tools <laughs> right right to manage a business right. I mean in our business alone we use you know ERP uh, piston monday.com mm. excel spreadsheets mm. emails i think text messaging has officially uh replaced phone calls that counts day absolutely age, right? yeah we text with our so, clients yeah. so from our perspective you know we get the pain point as yeah. well even as a 20 plus million dollar manufacturer so pain point number two sorry right, right. i, I yeah, want no. to interject and kind of validate that a little <laughs> incidentally when uh, the funny thing is if you've got uh international suppliers yeah. we've got a customer we're working with um who um, we just got the QuickBooks integration live last night, by the way. Congratulations. Um, so we'll be onboarding them this week. And um, they use, the, the, they got their uh, purchasing folks with WhatsApp and WeChat because they're, they're Asian, talking to them They're talking to yeah. Asian suppliers, and that's, that's their go to because they don't have you know, any type of messaging back and forth that makes sense for them. So, so there's tracking. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. communication. Yeah, right. So all of that is on the purchasing side. But the other two, two pain points to keep track, keep track of your question is that um, that problem in the purchasing 
cascades into the manufacturing floor. Absolutely. Of course. So now you're, Absolutely. you're you know, like, what? That's not coming? <clears throat> Were you able to pull on this? So there's just this constant replanning of the manufacturing floor. And sometimes you end up with, uh, you know, we talked about underutilized assets. Now all of a sudden, maybe you have to, it's going to be underlized even a little bit more because you can't make something. You have to hold something idle because just the plan. I can tell you as a manufacturing CEO, mm -hmm. Uh, that's been in the industry now for 23 years. I'm getting old. Um, nothing is more impactful from a negative perspective than shutting down production. Mm. You know, whether yes. it's not having the raw material on time. And, and by the way, the disruptions in the supply chain over the last 12 months oh. have been real and have been catastrophic. And we're in still cases. in it. Yeah. You know, you, when you start getting those delays around, you know, material deliveries, outside mm. service support, um, and, and the greatest issue today is when you quote, or let's say you quote a raw material, you quote on a project, you quote yeah. a raw material, you have 24 hours to buy yeah. that raw material. Otherwise, the price could change or the availability of that, that, yep. that material. We lost an order recently. Uh, Mike, tell that story. You know, no names or anything else, but because there was like a two week gap between quoting and winning the order. Yeah, absolutely. You know, none of our suppliers, especially ones that are, uh, we're buying materials that contain nickel. Obviously, everybody knows the, uh, the volatility for the, uh, nickel commodity has just been outrageous impacted by a lot of geopolitical issues that are going on at the moment but we're the uh, the fluctuations in cost and delivery are, have just been detrimental and actually we're quoting a uh, defense job right now for a uh, a client of ours i've had to requote the material every single day to make sure cost and price and they've they've changed every single day and hopefully they'll be making a decision today we've never mm -hmm. i've never seen in my 11 years, I haven't seen anything this chaotic at the moment. So, so the reason why I bring that up and talk about it is because you said pain point number two is really shutting down the production line. Mm. And the costliness, not only to uh, lost production opportunity costs, but also to customer delivery issues and reputation and all the other factors are related right. to that. So that's that you just kind of got us into the third. So before we go to the third, what you didn't say is another pain is um, – what the guys running your shop will tell you is like, well, I know that we're not util utilizing the assets, but we can make up as long as we're willing to pay overtime. So, right. yeah. so you get there's a cost factor. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, you get, True. so not only do you have under underutilized assets, but then you have more overtime, which doesn't make you like, that doesn't make sense. a real life example. Uh, just last weekend, we had a job with one of our clients and the sub tier supplier yep. was almost three weeks late. Mm. And, and it's a actually process. a little bit more. I'm yeah. oh, sorry, it might have been a little more. Yeah, yeah. And, and it's a process we cannot do, right? right? So it's quoted into the program yeah. that's communicated to our client, and because of that, the the late delivery. Well, our client didn't. They still need the parts when they still need the parts because yeah. it's for it's for aftermarket yeah. work. It's and not else. their problem. Well, it's guess not. what? We did on Saturday, Sunday, a week ago. Right. We worked uh, a crew of folks, twenty four hours a day from Friday night all the way to Monday morning, so that we could still ship that product coming that Monday. Yeah. Mm. It increased our cost. It increased yeah. our you know, talk about overtime. And I even had to incentivize them further than just typical time and a half, right? Because right. you're taking time away from your families. You're sure. you're working in long cycle hours. So we even did a further incentive on top of that. So all, all said, probably added $2,500 to that order, just an incentive pay because of supply chain difficulty. Right. Right. It's costly. Right. We certainly didn't quote that into the job. <laughs> well, you've got, by the way, you already answered the third pain point. So we, we, we always we've gotten to the point where now when we talk to customers, we say these are the three pain points, the procurement issues that we talked about, all the kind of the nonsense really that goes on there, how it then cascades forward into the production floor, utilization of uh, manufacturing assets, and of course, overtime. And then lastly, outbound to the customer. Um, one is you can also make up for things with premium outbound freight. So People are saying, okay, well, they still need it when they need it, so now I have to pay. Um, and when it up, goes international, rate. it is e expensive. Yeah, yes. right. It's so, and, and then, and then, most importantly, is what you said: reputation and revenue risk. And yep. so, and the 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 second and third problems are the ones that really have an impact. And right now, by the way. Um, it's still early if someone says, well, show me the ROI. It's like, we, we can't. We don't have the data yet. But that's like to, to look at this and say, well, how much time is it going to save one or two buyers in purchasing is, is that's kind the low, of a, That's the lowest hanging fruit, yeah, right? I mean, yeah, it's right, it's yeah. opportunity cost. It's revenue. Yeah, right, you, know, right. we, we, you know, we're working with a couple of clients right now. In one case, we're, we're discussing a, a price differential and and you know, uh, we they needed the parts because every day their their line is down is going to cost them you know fifty thousand dollars, 
that's really the ROI associated with getting line of sight to when your stuff's right. coming in and when it's supposed to be there and everything right. else. So I remember this pretty clearly. So coming out of that Q1 process, you know, we had the comp- you know, multiple conversations as a company. We said, okay, those multiple pain points, right? The, the, you, you place an order with a supplier. It's all spreadsheets, emails, text messages, yep. phone calls to really manage those things. And, and you know, I've been, <clears> like I said, I, I'm speaking from personal experience, not only as an employee of a large manufacturer, but as a CEO of one, that the traditional solution to tracking fulfillment, and anyone who is in supply chain knows exactly what I'm talking about. There's, there's not a single person watching, like, no, I don't know what you're talking about. No, fulfillment is always chaotic, and you throw more people at it, right? More people with more spreadsheets, you know, having more phone calls on a weekly basis with uh, customers or suppliers in that case, and, and, and really trying to track things through. So, and then the opportunity cost of production delays and everything else. So we set out, coming out of Q1, we said, you know what, let's first build, let's get the infrastructure of our software platform built. And, and, and for the audience, you know, you might be asking, what is Piston software? PJ is a lot more eloquent, a little more intelligent when he uh, discusses it, but I'll tell you what my view of it is. It's the operating system for managing all of your suppliers and everything outside the ERP system. And we get a lot of clients that say, well, I have an ERP system, I have SAP Ariba for that, and I get that, those are great tools, we interact with them a lot, but typically it's a static update, yes. where you'll pull information out of an ERP, yep. you know, whether it goes into an email blast or to an Excel spreadsheet, it typically goes out to the supplier, and I call it a static update, it's not a continuous live update, where they, they, they look at it and say, here's where I am, typically we'll send that back and that gets uploaded back into their ERP system on the other end. So we set out to build an order management module to first solve the fulfillment issue related to once orders are, are placed. Mm-hmm. Tell us a little bit about that process, how you set out to do that, and, uh, and, and we'll take it from there. Well, the details of building software can be a little bit... Uh, I don't think the uh, audience wants to A little bit boring, coding. right, right. So with that part, we'll skip. It's hard, it's important, <laughs> right. but it's tedious. Let's yeah. not talk about that. Yeah, details. right. So, but what we will say is um, what we did is we talked to a lot of people, both both customers that had the problem. We had the advantage of really talking to everyone at Package One. So we had, a, you know, the P1 folks were really helpful. Yeah, we're, 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 we're an incubator. Right, right. right. And, uh, but then that led, led us to speaking to a lot of your customers, a lot of your suppliers. From there, we were able to spread out even further. We, we, we networked. And um, once we heard what was going on, we tracked everything with Excel spreadsheets, mapped it out, did a bunch of boring business process mapping. And then what we started doing was we started designing visually what we thought would solve the problem. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't code. We didn't write a line of code for six months, I think. And, um, and that, we did that, and we started running, you know, prototypes, visual-based prototypes, saying what would make it easier. And we just did that on a continual basis. We got to the point where we thought we had. We had enough to go on, you know. We and someone said, you know, listen, start building that, and then we'll give you further feedback. And so, yeah. you know, that was it. And, and, and Michael, from internal perspective at P One, it's almost like an awkward romance with Piston, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> what where are you, you, where you going? I don't know. I'm <laughs> well, not not with not with PJ, right? Um, an awkward <laughs> romance with the idea of using a new software uh, to uh, manage our business with, right? Sure. So in the beginning, it's kind of like. You know the CEO is saying, "Hey, we're going on." Right, it's almost like a top-down. You know, it's not really. It wasn't really a grassroots thing. So there was a. It was an arranged marriage. Mm -hmm. Sure, even better. It's better than awkward. It was an arranged marriage. So I said, (laughs) you know, meet Piston, right? The software platform that we're going to use to to revolutionize our business and sell to the world, to transform how supply chain is done globally, and meet my team at P1. You're gonna you're gonna love Piston. You're gonna use Piston, and you're gonna change everything you're doing about your job. It was all voluntary. We we loved. Yes, yes. It was completely voluntary. But (laughs) funny, it wasn't voluntary on the front end. But fast forward to today, because we've been working hand in hand with Piston for the last two and a half years. Absolutely. And 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 tell me a little bit about how you have come around to really seeing this as a big problem and a great solution. Absolutely. So I've always wanted to, I've always been interested in software kind of from afar. Um, I don't even know how I ended up in manufacturing. I got a healthcare MBA. I don't even, I don't even know what I'm doing. We there. all still wonder how you ended up here. <laughs> <laughs> but here, hey, how you doing? Uh, and I always, you know, there's a lot of other companies out there like Zometry and Fast Radius. I'm like, this is interesting. You know, there's definitely opportunity to digitize an archaic industry. But uh, I've been working with PJ now for maybe 18 months on and off. And uh, we've had a lot of uh, customer calls, and lately 
the past two uh, demos and follow-up calls that we've had, clients are saying this is exactly what we've been looking for. And I'm, you know, and as a, from a sales perspective, I'm like, done. It's a ching. Done. Yeah. It, so th for me, it's been it's been revolutionary, and I'm very excited about the future. We have a couple uh, pending deals with some clients that we've been uh, potential clients we've been working with, and I'm excited about it. One thing too, I wanted to mention as well. You know, a lot of our clients use SAP and some other very expensive ERP. Great ERPs. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But I think that one of the big things about Piston is it was made from a supplier's perspective as well, not just the customer's. Right. A lot of, you know, we update other ERP systems on behalf of clients to let them know where we're standing. But, you know, really understanding what it's like on the supplier side and understanding a lot of the features that would in, uh, enable engagement and involvement in the system. There's a couple features that you guys have uh, introduced. I don't know if you want to get into them now. Oh, we, we're going to get into them, and I think they're important. But go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. But it, it really does help the buy-in. And the better data you put in the system, the better it's going to be. And ultimately, that's why I think Piston's going to outperform its competition. You know what's mm -hmm. funny about one, one word you used in that? Uh, very eloquent and intelligent overview of you know <laughs> piston thank you very much is are you uh, are you are you being condescending no i i think the world of you michael huh. the uh <laughs> oh no it's great <laughs> uh is the word engagement yeah right so if you think about level of engagement between customers and suppliers you know unfortunately over the last 40 years or so and I, i'm writing a blog post about it right now where the whole low-cost country thing really came about yeah. in the 1980s you know the supplier customer relationship became very transactional and, and, you know, even to some degree, we've been guilty of that, right? Every company's yeah. guilty of those things. Certainly. But what's interesting about post-pandemic and, and, and all the geopolitical risks in the world and, and all the upheaval that's going on, and, and we live in kind of a continual state of chaos, the supplier-customer relationship and the engagement between those two has never been more important. You know, because supply chain disruptions, quality, innovation, all the things that that relationship, you know, fosters, is becoming more important than ever. It's not about, it's not about the transactional cost only anymore. Yeah. It's also about delivery. It's also about inventory management. It's about innovation and technology and improvements in processes and so forth. So from that perspective, you know, we're we're kind of in this new engagement rich environment where I think Piston does a very good job of of really bringing those two things together and I think a lot of it has to do with the the you know, the chat tool the file sharing. Why don't you tell us a little bit about some of the yeah. features? So, and, and just to just to set that conversation up real quick, you know, today, you know, and I'll put it into my words because I use Piston every single day, and our company uses it every day to run our supply chain operations. It's really taking static uh, information from a spreadsheet and really putting it to on a visualized dashboard. What's highly interactive, so everything you have placed on your supply base is fully visual, color coded, highly interactive gives me a lot of engagement with what's what's late, what's coming late, what's on time, where things are at. But then you added a couple of tools to heighten the level of engagement to customers and suppliers. Talk a little bit about those tools. Yeah, so I'm gonna start a little high and then I'll connect down at the feature level. I'll start with the general idea that um, the notion of engagement around suppliers has some nuances that are important. Um, your supplier doesn't really want another email from you. <laughs> They don't want to, and they don't want to email you either, right? right? They 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 want they want to deliver on time yeah, at the right cost, be, yeah. and then they want another order. Yep. <laughs> that's what they want. <laughs> that's what that's what they want. So it's kind of tricky. They, they they want to be connected, and they want to be engaged at the right time. So so then you're like, okay, so they don't really want a piece of software. That they don't want to go on and do social media sharing or anything like that. They don't got time for any of that, right? But they, they do want to make certain that they know where the important information is. They want everybody, if there's a message that needs to be sent out, they want the people who need to see it to see it. If someone's, someone's uh, you know, goes out on maternity leave, is away for two weeks on vacation, it's like, well, I, I don't know. Until they get back, I won't know because all the information is inside someone else's inbox. That, mm -hmm. that, that. Spreadsheets so, on their desktop. Yeah, yeah. Th those, yep. those things are problems. So they, on the one hand, you know, they want kind of the minimum, most important engagement on a timely basis. And even then, the next trick is they want to be engaged where the problems are. Now, it's tricky because on uh, purchase orders, I don't know if you guys ever measured this. Have you ever measured at uh, P1, what percent of your purchase orders issued out to your suppliers go out and come back with no changes? The price doesn't change. The date doesn't change. There's no change on spec. Do you know what percent that is by any chance? It's low. It's I mean, definitely almost, low. There's almost change on everything. <laughs>
but because of the last couple of years where you know geopolitics the pandemic shipping delays big problems going on around the world never before has supplier relationships been more important for the competitive advantage for business models going forward. And I think the engagement piece is kind of the headset that we put on when we started designing Piston. How do we not only bring visibility and dashboard to all open orders once they're cut out of the RP system, but how do we increase supplier engagement to create more value for the customer and supplier relationship? PJ, we, we've talked a lot about this. You've brought new tools to market on the module that we currently have. Why don't you talk about things we did to increase engagement? Well, on the customer side, the first thing is the dashboard. Um, that just makes the, the tool easy to use, and you just kind of can click through and see what you want to see. On the supplier side, it happens at different levels. I, I like to say a supplier really doesn't want to get another email from you, and they don't want to send you an email. So we, we built in the chat tool right into the, the purchase order. You can see and talk about what's going on. Multiple people can see it unfold. Multiple people... It's like a group chat about a purchase order. and so At the everyone, line item level. At the well, line yeah. item level. So right. everybody knows what's going on. And then if there's file sharing needs to be done, you just share your files right there. So, so you know, you've said it. Um, it is kind of almost like having Slack around. Yeah, it's kind of oh. like we're Slack meets <laughs> yeah. an automated Excel spreadsheet. That's right. That's right. So the purchase order, a purchase order line item is, is like a Slack channel itself. You can, you can share files. Right. You can have a conversation. Everybody knows what's going on. And uh, and then, of course, for the ones that you don't need that level of information, you, you, there's just no activity. And incidentally, to also make it, uh, we did a couple other things. Uh, some suppliers are like, well, I don't, I don't want to be stuck behind my desk. Well, we made it so it's mobile, so right away. In the mobile works. version, I use it every day. It's fantastic. Right, and and we don't have it. We don't have an app. You just go to it on your phone, and it looks like an app. So we built it that way to make it easy. We also did things like built-in email interaction. So maybe some suppliers don't actually want to. Actually, actually, that was big for engagement. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let me tell you something. Yeah. But why don't you talk a little bit about that? Because that's a really important function of, of the system and the way right. you built it. Right. Now, I know, look, I'm not a software guy. Right. I don't build software for a living. You know, when we first talked, well, everyone does that. Mm. But it's so important to not force suppliers to have to log in the PIST right. in order to give updates. So, I mean, from your perspective, how does that work for us? Yeah, we so we work with a lot of, we work with probably 250 different suppliers across, you know, you're, they're supplying forging, castings, bar stock, plate. A lot of these companies have been around for a long time, and they may not want to interact and log in and get credentials and access software. And just being able to respond to the platform via email has driven engagement up at least about 35 40%. It's been a game changer. Yeah, I mean, think about it this way, and I, I want to talk about this from personal use because, you know, as the CEO of P1 Industries and P1 Ventures, I use the tool every day. So from my perspective, you can go into a line item. So you, everything's visualized. Right, every all the orders that got cut into our ERP system flow into the dashboard. I got a centralized dashboard. Supplier names on the left, number of line items open, what's late, what's currently on time, what's coming due in the next seven days, all on one centralized dashboard. I can click on anything that's late, one click, it opens up all the line items for that supplier and what's late, and I can I can re, I can hit one button that says request update. Yep. That update will be distributed to that supplier for all those line items, and what they receive on their end is an email. And in that email, they just click on a link. It opens up a little pop-up window, and they, they click on the dates or promise dates for those orders, a cost code or whatever. It uploads in the piston. You have live, real-time yep. information. I love that about it, that yeah. you built it in such a way. They don't have to log into the system. It fully integrates with email and everything else. That automation feature is huge, especially the update manager, which is going to be ready, I think, at the end of this month, where you have the differentiated automation going out to suppliers. Supplier A could be a forging supplier who's, you know, typically provides a 16-week lead time. You don't want to touch that supplier every day. It'd be useless. You want to check in with them every two weeks. You might have supplier B who's providing bar stock to you, who's usually the lead time maybe two to four weeks. Maybe you want to touch them two times a day. And you can automate that differentiation between those vendors. Mm -hmm. One of the actually we have another call with a potential client in uh, April who mentioned that, you know, they're they're buying stuff that's got, you know, sometimes 52 week lead times. He's buying stuff that from McMaster Car with, you know, three day lead time. You want to build in that automation to make it useful so you're not just touching everybody the same way. That's right. Yeah. If you're, if you're talking, uh, if you're an electronics contract manufacturer, the funny thing is you've got semiconductor suppliers where some parts will be there in two to four week lead time yeah. and others are 26 to 50 yeah. week lead time. And you can't treat those suppliers the same. Right. It's different. Right. Right. But no, the funny thing is you can have one supplier right, who, right. who has such a variety of parts yes. that it actually yeah. spreads I, across. I, I, remember, I remember when I was a buyer at a large business 
And, you know, we'd have our production meetings twice a week, Tuesdays and Thursdays. I think they were at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And I'd have to go out and get all the updates from my suppliers, put it on a static spreadsheet. Um, and then I would go into that meeting and I'd walk down my spreadsheet mm. of when things are coming in. I'd be prepared, obviously. And then whoever's running a production meeting will ask a bunch of series of questions. Can you pull this in? Can you push mm. that out? And I have to write all these notes and I have to go back to my desk and I'd have to write emails and kind of check off, check off. And by the way, it's 2022. That's exactly the same way it's happening today. <laughs> so what I love about Piston is I can open up my app in a meeting and I can click on a chat tool and type a quick chat inside the tool. Hey, Mr. Supplier, any chance you could pull this in two days? Right. They get an immediate notification on their mobile app or on their, on their web and they can respond to me in real time. Or I can re request an update and it updates everything in real time across the dashboard. I can do that in real time today. And, and, and by the way, the other engagement tool, which I think is very powerful, is file upload. We share so many files yeah. with suppliers through the fulfillment process. Drawings, specifications, material test reports, dimensional reports, certificate of conformances. That whole – so today, they, that we request from a supplier, hey, can you send us the material test reports, blah, 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 whatever we're requesting from them. They email us everything. We, we print it out. Okay. Now I'm, 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 you might be saying, well, P1, you're, you're an advanced company. So yeah, we print that out. We check everything. We put our nomenclature on it because it serialized everything. And then we upload it. We, we scan it back into our desktop, put a name on it, and then put it into our shared server. Very efficient. So if you want to find something, you got to go back through email, shared service, and everything else. Tell us how the file upload tool works. You drag and drop a document onto a purchase order line item and it stays there forever. Forever. And it's all in one place. So Love you're that. telling me in Piston, we can open up a line item. It'll show every every uh, history of communication across that line item, the performance of the supplier, and all of the uploaded files in one location on an AWS server somewhere in the world. Yep. That's it. That sounds a little bit better. That sounds a little bit that better. sounds a little bit better. Yeah, but I can't watch you get tortured through the process at our, plant, at our business. Well, that would that would be very detrimental to our clients, though. <laughs> okay, clients so first. PJ, we, we, we've been we've been building this now for the last couple of years with P1. We're using it to run our business. It's transformed how we're running our business. Um, we're commercializing that right now. Tell us about that launch. So you know, we're announcing the launch of um, this first module this week. Um, we've uh, had a nice uh, a nice run now with uh, P1 for. Full live environment. Where are we in March? My God, it's been five, six months now, and um, we got two more customers that we're uh, piloting and uh, working with Michael and Tony. We've built ourselves, starting to build ourselves a nice sales backlog. I mean, the trick is, people don't know th that there's a better way. You know, I like to compare it back to there was a time. I love this. You told me this. I love <laughs> this story. Well, there was just a time twenty years ago, and. For a big chunk of this audience, they won't remember, and the other half will. And that is, doesn't everybody keep track of all your sales leads in a little book that you keep in your in, in your pocket? Doesn't everybody keep track of sales on a spreadsheet or just kind of buried in your email? And the answer was, 20 years ago, I would tell you that it, probably 75%. I mean, the, the, actually, 20 years ago, the acronym CRM was just being invented. You know, the idea of customer relationship management. So the sales teams of the world had to learn that, oh, my God, there's a better way to do this. And, and by the way, sales teams are distributed. Customers are distributed. Mm -hmm. Housing all that information on a shared server with real-time live updates and knowing exactly the last yeah. time that customer was spoken to, the last thing that they did for them. That's ubiquitous today. It's something that is, right. is expected in any right. sales organization around the world. Right. It didn't exist 25 right, years ago. Right, right. And so, and so talking about this problem, you know, has its challenges. It's, it all starts with if you're using Excel and email to manage your supply chain, there's a better way. There's I mean, a better way. So. so dare I say, Michael loves when I put big, big uh, notions out there. On his, I, I, one of our podcasts, I said, dare I say, I want to be the next General Electric of Schenectady. <laughs> right? So we <laughs> said that. Salt Electric. <laughs> no, I don't. Do salt, do salt's way too long. It's hard to pronounce and it's not easy to spell. We'll go with P1 Industries. Um, dare I say that we're entering an era of the emerging SRM movement, supplier relationship management movement, where CRM was 25 years ago, 
I believe SRM supply relation manager mm -hmm. is today where, where they were 25 years ago. Here's why pandemic chaos, geopolitical risks, shipping delays, visibility more important than ever, manufacturing capacity and cost more important than ever, innovation more important than ever. We're entering an era of supplier relationship management. 20 years from now, we'll be looking back saying, Piston is a new sales force. Mm. Piston is for suppliers, which is, by the way, the largest expense for most companies on the planet, right? Not payroll, not rent, supplier management and the costs associated with buying direct products for finished products is the highest cost for almost every manufacturer in the world. And SRM is going to change the game forever. And I think Piston is going to be the pioneer in the space. And 20 years from now, we'll be talking about Piston in the same breath that we talk about Salesforce. Dare I say that, Michael? Yeah, you just said it. So I guess we got to <laughs> do it. <laughs> I think we're, we're, we're in for exciting times. You know, from my perspective, you know, PJ is a seasoned CEO. Um, he's building an incredible software company. That's why we spun it out as a software company. We believe that it's very valuable for anyone using Excel, the spreadsheets, and email to manage their supply chain. And we're super excited about the future. P1 is using Piston every single day to run its business. And it would take another hour podcast to talk about the transformative effects it's had in our business already. So we're in the process right now. So I'll tell you a little bit about what the next steps are for Piston, PJ, and I talk about it every week. We want to really build a good relationship with 10 to 15 customers to take it to the next level. And I'm telling you right now, get in right now because you're at the early stages. It's already a functioning tool. It's transformative for your business. And I think that it's going to be incredible going forward. PJ, tell me real quick and, and, and as we close, what are the one next one or two modules that are going to be game changing to really build out this CR or SRM or this operating system for supply chain management? Well, there's two, two places we're going to go right away, and that is once you have all of your transactions with your suppliers inside a system, right away you're going to say, can't you just scorecard my suppliers now just on an ongoing basis? I mean, they're performing, the data's in the system, who's doing well, who's not doing well, who's trending up, who's trending down. So that's, the, that's one place we're going to go. And then... Separate but closely related is supply chain analytics. The the other thing about and quoting and quoting. So that's and that we expect that to come next. So that's kind of the sequence of events: scorecarding, supplier analytics, and then then we'll go to quote. I can almost envision that's the, the supplier scorecarding being similar to the Uber uh, rates. The, the interesting thing is, you know, we we really, you know, our sweet spot is kind of you know twenty to one hundred million dollar um, manufacturers. That's really where we're focusing right now, and. Uh, Something you didn't mention is that a lot of these customers have similar problems on their outbound supply right. chain. So, yeah. so there's, um, so you know, it's that whole space. I mean, in the end, you said something earlier, which was, you know, you talked about how important ERPs are, and they are. And what we see ourselves playing is sitting in between. You know, so you know, a manufacturing. If you're going to visualize it, a manufacturer is a box, and they're a box with a whole bunch of assets inside it and people. And they're connected to a bunch of box that sends stuff into their box. And they do things inside their box, and they send stuff outside of their box to a whole bunch of other boxes. Yep. We connect the boxes. Beautiful. I love it. Michael, last word on Piston. Bridging commerce. Synchronizing the world of commerce. Sorry, UPS. <laughs> <laughs> you steal that for somebody? <laughs> Any last words on Piston? Oh, call us if you, uh, if you think you'd like to pilot the software. Yeah, we want, we want people to partner with us. We're excited about this. Thanks for uh, staying with us today. Well, and thank you for the P1 Ventures podcast where manufacturing is more than a career, it's a calling. 